John is the uh, Harold M. Brie Professor of Business Administration you know, at Harvard Business School. You know, uh, when they sent out the invite for this uh, you know, conference, you got to see that John is a very you know, esteemed star marketing professor you know, in terms of the uh, number of publications, the work he's done, the impact, his service to the community in terms of editorial awards. And John is talking to us about sort of, you know, consumer reactions to big data, regulations to this, and how the world is changing in terms of how we innovate and learn from big data. So thank you, John, for being with us. Thank you. It, it, it's certainly uh, thanks to Leyland for the invitation and thanks to Vancouver, which is just the most wonderful city in the world. Glenn and I both lived in the second best city in the world, which is Cape Town in South Africa. But uh, everything that Cape Town has, Vancouver has, and just a little more. <laughs> yeah. So it's wonderful to be here. Um, this this uh, talk will be about um, a, a project that took place uh, the summer before last. Uh, so I apologize for it being a little rusty, but I, I, have, I found that, it, that what we found in that study was sufficiently interesting to me that it's continued to spark a lot of um, thinking in this, in this direction and is leading toward the idea of a, um, a course in the MBA program structured uh, uh, on, on this topic. Um, and um, just to explain why a course might be appropriate for this topic, I, I want to draw a, an often drawn analogy between, between data and oil. Um, so to imagine you were, you know, you were, uh, imagine there was an MBA program around the beginning of the, of the hydrocarbon-based economy, and you kind of had a vision that, that this was going to change a lot of things. It was going to change transportation and, uh, and, and, and heating and, and, and uh, permit the production of electricity. All, all sorts of things would flow from it. And you knew that there were a lot of people in, uh, in business schools, assuming they had existed, who would have wanted careers in some facet of that industry. Would it have not have been appropriate to build a course that kind of laid out the, uh, the nature of the ecosystem? And uh, the parallel to data would be quite stark. You, you have a, um, you know, you, you're prospecting. You find, uh, you find a source of, of data or oil. You require to extract that. Uh, ETL is, of course, the term of art in, in data, extract, load, and transform. But you know, extraction and refining is the equivalent in, in oil. Uh, you create a variety of products from the, uh, the, 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 the raw material. Uh, those products have to be taken to market, so you build a distribution system, you have, you have gas stations, you have brands, and, and, and so on. Uh, and then, of course, you have pollution at the end, um, <laughs> which, which we, in, in, in data we have in abundance. So um, <laughs> uh, we, can, we can sort of visualize how a course would, would construct that, that value chain, and that, that, was, that was part of what initiated this project. Um, the, the focus is not on all data, um, and that's a serious limitation for the purposes of preparing students. It, it means this is not, in my envisioning of it, a big data course per se. It's a personal data course. And personal data is where the edge is in this thing. Nobody's really uh, too troubled by um, a world in which data itself is, is more abundantly useful as an economic resource. It seems like an unmitigated good thing. But personal data is a two-edged sword. It, obviously, the, uh, the invasion of privacy is the dark side of, of that. And I, I will try to be relatively agnostic. I'll try, but I'll fail. <laughs> because I got to say, um, well, you'll, you'll, it'll emerge. My prejudices will emerge. But, but keep in mind, I try to suppress them. So um, <laughs> a personal data ecosystem is a system of firms that collects and applies data about individuals on behalf of sellers uh, to the task of finding and cultivating buyers. And, and just a word about data about individuals, um, it's generally classified as um, personally identifiable data and pseudonymized data, PII and PI. Personally identifiable data is data that permits you to uh, go to the person at an, a physical address. Um, identifies that person relatively uniquely and persistently, well, I should say persistently, uh, for, for, you know, uh, uh, for, for months, years, sometimes decades at a time that PII will, will persist. Pseudonymized information 
uh, is a much more transitory uh, form of identification, but it nevertheless meets the basic test of, um, of identifiability. I, I, I like this definition because it hadn't occurred to me, but the, the definition of anonymity, which is obviously the absence of personal uh, identity, the definition of anonymity is the inability to meet, to, to find a person on a subsequent encounter. So obviously it's not invisibility, you're present in the encounter, but you're anonymous if I can't get back to you at a later point or know you when you turn up later. So both of those forms of personal data uh, defy that property. They permit um, uh, recognition on a subsequent encounter. The difference is uh, most obviously in the length uh, of time between the encounters. Okay, so, so, so that's what we're looking at. Um, the method uh, was to value the system as a flow of payments. It has very much an accounting flavor to it. We were accounting for payments that we could observe in the published accounts of, of the companies in their, in their uh, SEC filings. And these are payments made by marketers for data dependent services. And we subtract from that the money that those marketers gained by selling their own data. So it's a net uh, transaction and it's, it, it's really easy to double count when you're doing this kind of exercise. So we, we made a rule that we would count uh, payments by marketers and not the reciprocating um, you know, revenues generated in, in the other direction. Uh, and it results from the, the sale of data, or to put it more uh, generally, the flow of data. So we're only able, in this method, to see the value of data in exchange. When data is exploited within a firm, it's not available to, to audit. And I think that has very important strategic implications for, um, for the future direction of the industry and for entrepreneurship. Um, and the services in general are ad marketing services, advertising distribution, and the provision of, of, of consumer services. Um, this picture sort of captures what we are trying to do. So we recognize there are a group of companies over here, uh, a very large group of companies. In a sense, most companies today make some use of personally identifiable data for some of their business practices. There are the consumers and business buyers over there, and in the middle is the ecosystem that we studied. This is a collection of firms um, that exist to provide transactions on behalf of these companies. Now, some of these companies do the work themselves. So credit card issuers, for example, do a pretty good job of internalizing all of their personal data uh, activity. And this has the, the, the effect that, that our estimate of the size of this economy will be understated. But we don't think by all that much because a lot of the firms here do like to, to buy services out. Uh, and, and if they don't buy the entire service out, if they don't literally you know, bypass the system, then they at least purchase some significant part of the material they need in order to be able to reach their consumers directly. Even credit card companies are major customers of companies like Axiom and Experian. So you'll see how that unfolds. Okay, so there's a system. We're going to measure it uh, literally by, you know, by enumeration. We started with a list of about three and a half. I should mention the co-authors. So Peter Johnson at, the university, at Columbia University was a co-author on this, and we had a team of about four people, five people who worked with us to do a lot of the legwork because as you'll see, it was quite laborious. Um, uh, and I should mention Leora Kornfeld was one of that, that team because she is a former Vancouverite uh, known to Jan and, and uh, a participant in Mobile Muse for, for quite a while. Um, although this, remember, is the United States, so she made no use of insights into the equivalent economy in Canada. Um, so we had this team. Um, enumerate all the companies we could think of that could possibly be in this ecosystem. We came up with about three and a half thousand companies. We, uh, we did a lot of this by, um, by what are known as the Lumascapes. Some of you will know the Lumascapes. I'll show you one of them. Uh, uh, we literally created a spreadsheet of every company mentioned by Luma, which is a, a VC firm that does a lot of trades in this area. And, um, and, and then we looked more carefully at those and we, and we found that about 650 really mattered. 
uh, partly by a, as a function of size and, and partly by a function of the likelihood that they were doing significant work with personal data. We took the 650, identified 60 of them that were in some sense representative, and interviewed the 60 uh, on the telephone. And then we tried to develop rules based on those 60 that would generalize to the 650. The result of this study is the conclusion that firms spent about $156 billion in 2012 uh, on marketing services that could not have been performed uh, without individual level consumer data. Or to be more honest, could have been performed in some fashion, probably at much greater cost. So I think you'll see that the general effect of using personal data is to produce efficiency, uh, to be able to achieve the same results with, um, with much less of a scattershot approach to the marketing activity. Now, is 156 billion a big number or a small number? Uh, we didn't know, and I'm not sure we know to this day. Um, nobody really seems to know how much money is spent in America, in the United States of America, on marketing. Um, there, there is a CMO uh, group organized by Christine Moorman at Duke University, and she does a survey of her members and comes up with a, an average of about 10%, 11% of revenues of her member companies being applied to marketing. This ranges from two to, to 30. It's a very dispersed number, so it's not clear that it'll generalize that well to non-members. But if we took that sort of 10% as a rule, uh, we come up with an answer that the US spends about $1.2 trillion <coughs> on marketing, um, <clears throat> which I think of as a kind of a deadweight loss, actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, despite my um, having made a living as a marketing professor, and despite the guilt that makes me feel, it, it's, it's generally the case that if, if things worked well, you wouldn't spend anything on marketing. The New York Stock Exchange does not spend a lot of time marketing individual securities. It doesn't say buy my IBM stock versus that one, because the market has achieved high levels of efficiency. So in a general sense, the use of data, the use of perfect matching, will reduce both the denominator and the numerator. Um, but for the moment, the conclusion that we would reach is that, is that of all the work that we teach in marketing, about 10 to 15% of it uh, is individual data dependent in a fairly crucial sense. So if you're going to regulate that activity, you're going to be putting um, you know, a significant amount of economic activity uh, under, under you know, a, a heightened level of scrutiny. Um, is it growing? Or, uh, it's certainly going to be growing, yes. Uh, how much it will grow, um, I don't know. I, I think it peaks out at about 50%. It seems to me that personal selling will always have a, a vital role. Um, I'm a great believer in television advertising. It, it, uh, it, at least non-discriminating video display, whether it be on digital media or on broadcast, will be part of the way markets work for at least as long as I can visualize because it's so tremendously powerful and because there are certain kinds of communication that are just a lot better done uh, using the devices of, of television than the one-to-one -one style of marketing that, that we're focusing on here. By the way, um, I, I'd, I'd much rather take questions and disagreements and particularly disagreements as they come up <laughs> and clarifications rather than have questions at the end. So just feel free to butt in. Um, uh, so, yeah, so we're, we're I mean, as somebody put it the other day, we're, we're, we're just in, in, exiting the, the, the adolescent years of the internet. You know, it's, it's 20 years old or whatever it is, um, <clears throat> maybe 25, depending on where you, where you start counting. And it's been a gawky adolescent, and it's now becoming a, 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 a violent and disruptive uh, early adult. Um, causing a lot of dislocation and disruption to a lot of other uh, industries, most painfully newspapers, of course. But um, it has a long, long life ahead of it. And most of what's captured in, in this thing is a snapshot of, a, uh, of, of the creature at that moment in its, in its development. Okay, um, we looked at the ecosystem and we sliced it into a, a kind of a supply chain. We, we saw... Um, Firms that were concerned with deciding what the ecosystem should do for the clients. We saw firms that were concerned with delivering that to customers. 
and we saw this, this thing that we were most uh, unsure about, the machinery that permitted the strategy to be executed through the, um, the customer-facing media. The, the media are, are, of course, very familiar to you. Um, search and display, um, and, and you're going to see that, that we also include um, mail and, and the phone. And then over here, you get ad agencies, WPP being the most interesting, and you get a group of much smaller, but likely um, the meek who are about to inherit the earth, the direct agencies that are, that are also part of that strategy process. Well, Google would typically be? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I thought Google would be, would be enormous here, and you'll see that in a minute. Yeah. Um, but, but implied in the idea that the post office is part of our economy is we sliced this way. We sliced an offline world using largely personally identifiable data, and we, and we identified in this horizontal split the, um, the, op, the online community, uh, which uses pseudonymized data. And uh, the striking thing about looking at the two together is, is that you see how interdependent they are and to what extent they're not interdependent. Because this is a world that has existed for something like 150 years. Um, Montgomery Ward, you know, early catalog retailer, um, it's, it's pretty mature. Its practices are embedded in our culture. We, we know what it means to get junk mail. We know, we know what it means to get uh, unrequested telephone calls. We have shut down the most obnoxious of those. Australia has managed to shut down unsolicited uh, direct mail. I don't think that's going to happen culturally uh, in other parts. But we know what we can do with these threats. This is where life is very, very unfamiliar. This is where yeah, we're scared. Well, give me an example. Oh, well, I get personal emails from, from companies. So they, they obviously have an identifier. They know they're talking to me at my email address. So we classified email uh, as, <laughs> it may seem, un, 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 I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a problem, yes. But we classified them here. Oh, I guess the word offline was. Exactly. <laughs> you're quite within your rights to, right. uh, in fact, you're just reading the the common sense meaning of what I wrote. But we treated email largely uh, here for this reason. So if you look at where the data is coming from, uh, there are two radically different systems. So perhaps the word online offline is not the sharp distinction, but source of the data is the sharp distinction. So this is the world, as I say, that we've been building over 150 years. Largely, actually, the data comes from the government. It's, you know, it's, it, the Department of Motor Vehicles, postal change of address, the registry of uh, real estate titles, all of these are handed out by the government for compensation and form the basis of lists. Then there are a few commercially based lists, magazine subscriber lists, bank records, merchant files, etc. These are aggregated into lists, passed through list brokers and become the basis of this, uh, of this ecosystem. And then there's this new world, something like 15 to 20 years old, in which the opposite is happening. There is no assembling of lists, it's rather like a spider sitting in a web waiting for the fly to come in. And when the fly comes in, the fly is identified through a set of, of, of ways of identifying that this is not an anonymous visitor but can be recognized on a subsequent encounter. For example, their, uh, their cookies, their uh, mobile um, passive device fingerprints, and, and so on. So all of those. So you see, you see the radical difference. We can't, here we can decide who we want and buy the list. Here we can't decide, and we have to simply grab them when they, when they arrive if we want them, or not grab them if we don't want them. Into that perfect system comes a, 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 a set of industries that have been built up to link the two systems. Um, so at this point, the PII, PI distinction starts to crumble to a degree. And this was noticed by the Federal Communications, uh, sorry, the Federal Trade Commission uh, at the beginning of, of 2014, because they saw that, sure, you could make an argument that we're used to this and that this is scary, but the two don't mix together. But then they saw a group of firms that were making the two worlds work together. And so over the course of 2014, they held hearings and they brought in a list of companies which was very helpful to us because we immediately you know, made sure they were in our database. 
and they asked these companies to disclose their business practices and to explain why they shouldn't be regulated out of existence. Interestingly, in October, I think, of last year, they issued their report, and they did not call for the regulation of these people, which they called uh, um, uh, uh, data brokers, and uh, they referred to this practice as onboarding. Now, how onboarding operates is, is actually very simple. If you go to Match.com, which is a, a very important player in the space, you obviously register with a real name, so, and, and you're also cookied. So Match.com is an important source. As a data of, broker. As a data broker, yeah. And there are a, a number of companies that have that property that they can be cookied, capturing their, uh, their, their, their uh, digital flow, and they can, uh, and it's a requirement of business that you disclose your, your PII. Um, <clears throat> so the companies that have been built up to exploit this are not Match.com themselves, but a set of companies that have got the technology in place to make these mergers. And I'll, I'll mention a couple by name uh, later on. At this point, apparently, only about 15% of, of uh, online traffic can be mapped to a physical identity. So the, the mapping is, is, is unreliable, and it's also not very persistent. So the, the value of a cookie that links to an address apparently is, is about $15 per name, not per thousand, but per name. Uh, but it will only be valuable for about a month, 10 days to a month. Because of that, by that point, one of the, one of the links, the cookie or, the, or something, will have changed. And be it within that period, the reason it's worth $50 is that name will be resold many, many, many times to people who want to, uh, uh, give, to give you a, uh, a hypothetical example. Say you're Chase Bank and you've got a credit card uh, a holder who's inactive, uh, and, and you want to reach them and see if you can activate them. Uh, well, it's very helpful if you've, you've got their physical address, if you can find their digital address so that you can recognize them when they appear on the web and talk to them uh, through, through um, display ads or, or whatever. Uh, uh, maybe try to channel them to a website where you can speak specifically to them. So that would be an example where it's well worth Chase to buy the, the matching list of their customers and these, these pseudonymized people on the, on the internet. Um, this is the, the Lumascape stuff. There's, there's lots of these things. That, this one's for commerce, this one's for display. They're completely useless, right? Unless you're, um, unless you're one of those names or you're someone buying the, the, the kinds of companies that are going on here. But, but Luma does this, I think, with a deliberate intention of making their services appear valuable. Um, but notice the structure isn't all that different. So there's WPP, a strategist. And over here, you've got Facebook. So when we come along, we just do it a lot more, more simply. Um, so that's, I'm going to pause here for a second, because the conclusion I had at, at the end of the study was that we had unearthed the skeleton of, of the ecosystem. Um, and in, in the sense that if you go to a museum of natural history and you run down the aisles from birds to, uh, to, to, to mammals to amphibians or whatever you do, you see, and you're looking at the skeletons, you'll see that the skeletons of all, um, um, of all, all mammal or reptilian creatures have, have important structural features in common. They generally have big uh, bony structures here to carry weight, another big bony structure here to protect the brain, uh, a lighter but pretty good structure around the vital organs. And, then, and then what happens as you go from a bird to an elephant is simply a... Um, uh, um, um, change in, in the relative proportions of, of these essential elements of the structure. So what we think, or what we thought we had uncovered was the skeletal structure of the ecosystem so that as we think about this from an entrepreneurial point of view or from an institutional point of view, we can sort of imagine where the innovation is going to, to glom onto the, um, the skeletal structure. Uh, so, <clears throat> to some extent, what I showed you earlier was based on this analysis. So you'll see here we have a concentration of consumer-facing functions, here strategic, and then we have these uh, machinery functions. And the most important thing to make 
to say about the machinery is that it divides into two groups with similar functions but very different methods. So customer targeting is the set of players that work with data that comes in this direction. And then audience selection is the set of institutions that work with data that goes in the opposite direction. So the audience selection job is to play the role of the spider in the web and decide when someone arrives on a website, do we want them or do we not want them? So these are the players. So there's, of course, Google, absolutely dominant in search and mobile. Uh, face, Facebook really only gets a look in uh, on, on display. And uh, mobile is in the hands of Google for, for advertising purposes. So that you know, represents visually the magnitude of the, of the Google uh, dominance of the space at the moment. Down here you have, um, uh, interestingly, these players are quite large. And these squares, to some extent, represent magnitude, approximately, not very, not very well. Uh, but firms like Catalina, Dunhumby, Convergesis uh, are companies that run loyalty programs. <clears throat> and loyalty programs are very, very powerful elements of this data system because they combine transaction data with access data. Then you have uh, the US Postal Service uh, and, and Quad Graphics. Quad Graphics is on that slide because it does, um, it does uh, variable printing. It'll print special issues of Time Magazine just for golfers. And it'll print catalogs in multiple varieties. Uh, and in that sense, is tailoring the message to data about the recipient. Um, Dial America is part of the, the phone system. There are a number of email marketers, which to, your, to, to the point you raised, we have listed as, as part of, of the, um, the data system because they're really fed by lists of email addresses. These companies are all old world companies, with the exception of Salesforce, I think. So Axiom's 80 years old, um, Experian, similar sort of age. Earthlink is a product of, of the internet era. Hart Hanks is a very old company. It's the largest mass mailer in, in the United States. So that's who these people are. These are generally much newer. Companies like Blue Kai, uh, we'll talk about some of these as we go on, are companies that are highly entrepreneurial and um, have come into being largely because of this new, uh, the, the demands of this new information flow process. Then there are a few other functions. We include UPS because it's like the US Postal Service has a lot of potential. Uh, Nielsen is a measurement company. There is a commerce play um, that's important. Um, interestingly, as, as we then put numbers on, the, on these players, we found that there was more money in, um, in the physical individual level data economy than in the digital. And uh, that's probably not going to change that fast. Uh, but there is a, a big group of players Notice I've listed them more like at, at the strategy end, who, who are in both areas, uh, who are essentially choosing, do I go to, do I make my, my, my play to the consumer market by, by, um, you know, by the old world or by the new world? Um, and these are the relative magnitudes that make up those big numbers that I just showed you. I think a, a good way to make vivid the, um, the, the similarity, the correspondence between these two worlds is to look, is to say, is to compare Google to the US Postal Service. In a way, a post office is really just an extremely slow uh, server, um, where Google will deliver you an, a, a person in a fraction of a second. The post office will deliver you a person in two to three days. So it's curious that they're, in terms of contribution to this ecosystem, they're of about equal value. They, they each come in at about, if you add up all the Google elements, you're getting to, to, uh, to 21. Post office, when you subtract out quad graphics, is at about, uh, is about, 18, uh, about uh, 28. Could you just show us what that number actually means? This is the, the, the sum of payments made by people outside the system to these players for services rendered. Per, per contact? Per year. Per year. These are, these are, um, these are billions, yeah. Right. And so for the post office, it's not the total revenue of the post office. It's the, it's the amount of 
first class commercial mail. It's, it's uh, second class commercial mail, not, not first class. So anything, if you receive a communication that's uh, to the resident, to the occupant, not counted. But if you receive something tailored to you, with your name on it, is counted. And the chances are, increasingly, that something that's coming to you personally may actually be informed by things that you did here. So there are coupon programs that are, uh, determ that are determining the envelope contents based on evidence of transactions. So, so th that is, you know, crucially requires the, the personal name, <coughs> name and address. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering about vertical integration. Does it exist? Is it allowed? Is there more in the other columns? Or And by ver vertical, you mean, uh, in this picture, horizontal. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, the, when I said I thought I'd found the skeleton, increasingly over the year and a half since we got that structure, we have seen these, these roll-ups that are blurring the structure. Um, and I actually have a slide uh, that will you know, put some numbers on some of these things, but, but it's a very important point. Uh, and, and speaks directly to this, the innovation theme which underlies my reason for presenting this to you. So w what are the implications for someone trying to start something up? Oh. Uh, can you walk me through, this is super fascinating to me, and I'm a Starbucks addict, and so I have the um, app, but it's connected also to, it sends me mail to my house, it sends me email, it sends things to my work, which I've never told them. And then no, it's awesome. I've never told them, but they must have got it from the email because I have a signature file. Um, and then it's also um, telling me about coffee makers at home, which I would have thought might be a cannibalizing technology, but the only place that I've done any coffee behavior would have been with this app. Mm -hmm. So how does it, can you, how would it, how do they integrate? Because some of these are hitting several of me and returning it to me. Do you know, so. Yeah. So uh, you could say that you told it everything it needs, and so it's not using the personal data ecosystem at all, because you just told it, and it's just acting on your requests. And we wouldn't have counted that. But the chances are it's in here that it's being managed by, right, by a third party. And, and so that third party is coming back here and looking at targeting information. So it's gone to Axiom. Axiom knows. 200 things about you, so the story goes. It's got a file with your name in it, every name in the United States, and next to it, 200 fields of activity. It knows if you have a pet, how many pets. It knows if you're married. It knows the value of your house. It's got a pretty good uh, idea of what you earn. Um, as, as the Axiom people said, because they're trying to run their business in a, in a dignified way. They don't want to be regulated out of existence. And they said, so we, we tell you what we know about you. But what we find hard to tell you is what, what we know about you can tell us what you don't tell us uh, and you don't know that we know about you. So, he, <laughs> so they have an algorithm that will predict your household income to, uh, you know, to, to, to within five to 10% of accuracy using many of the fields that they're willing to tell you they know. So if you have a dog, that up goes your income. Some of the street people to the, to the contrary, most people <laughs> who have dogs, <laughs> well, the do those dogs have people, but among, <laughs> among people who have dogs, you know, there's a measure of, uh, then there's your, your zip code, there's a, a variety of predictors that can be used to, to determine your income. And no, you know, people would in general not be relied on to, to report income. So, so, I ask one more yeah. question? so I know uh, Alden Lee is on our board and he's also on the Starbucks board. So he told me that they're sharing information with uh, Fitbit and Nike on fitness. Really? So yeah, so is that captured in here too? But well, uh, so, uh, let's see, if, if Fitbit, uh, if, if Starbucks, if Fitbit sells to anybody, and, and we're able to see any evidence that they do that, yes, then Fitbit's sales of personally identifiable data are, are known, yes. Fitbit's not in this sample. In fact, there are no bi biometric um, <clears throat> data gatherers, uh, largely because it wasn't a big deal. I've I got to say, although I think the structure is relevant to innovation, our cutoff threshold was a billion dollars of uh, transaction revenue. Since we got to you know, 157 billion, we were getting into rounding errors if we took anything smaller than a billion. So there are a lot of little companies that, that don't show up in our spreadsheet, that aren't in the 650, but there's pretty strong clues as to what, you know, what is the value of Fitbit's data. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, so that, uh, 
it's because they found a connection between people who drink coffee, expensive coffee, and people who are fitness enthusiasts or who monitor, and so they're sharing this data. Precisely, yes. And I would imagine that work was either done here by, uh, by, by the strategy thinking people or conceivably by someone like Dunhumby. Um, and, and, and that's, to your point about integration, that's what's making me feel uncomfortable about my structure. Not about my process, but it was, it was reassuring or consoling to think that we could locate strategic thinking at the front end of a supply chain. But we're finding sort of embedded intelligence all the way down the, the, the chain. Um, so since the study, I mean, this is the slide I refer to. Look at, look at what's happening. So Alliance Data, which is a big loyalty program company, does airline frequent flyer programs and so on, actually does um, Air Miles Canada, I believe, yeah? They're the owner of Air Miles Canada, which we didn't count because it's not in the United States. Um, they just bought ValueClick, which is in, I, I, yeah, so I've got a little quote from the press release. So value changed its name to Conversant because it was getting out of the ValueClick origins of the business. Uh, and, and, and they make the point that Alliance data focuses on direct mail, loyalty programs, airline miles programs, catalogs, and, and well, if you ignore digital, everything below the line. Whereas uh, Conversant is on digital marketing like search, social, and mobile. So what that acquisition does is it pulls these two together. And as somebody on the board said, it, it bulks up Alliance data in digital marketing, which has experienced the, the fastest secular growth. So, so they call it a $400 billion um, uh, marketing spend, uh, but we, we, we think that's overstated. We, we think it's closer to you know, 150. Then you get uh, Facebook buying LiveRail, which is a video delivery system, so that Facebook is now the second largest deliverer of video, uh, and all of it individually addressed to particular Facebook members. Yahoo does a parallel purchase of Brightroll. Oracle buys data logics. So data logics is the most, to my mind, the most interesting company in this space. And I watched it grow because it was founded by the guy who was once an employee of, of um, of Air Miles Canada, went on to run Nectar in the UK. Uh, I wrote a case on Nectar, so I got to know him. He came back to the United States, lives in, in, Bo in Boston, and, and told me that he had this ambition to roll up all the loyalty programs of all the supermarkets in the United States. And that would have been the moment at which you would have called him an entrepreneur. So he went out and he did it. And he now has every single uh, loyalty program uh, pingable on a daily basis. So then he goes to Facebook and says, do you want to know if your ads are working? Link up with us and we will tell you if three weeks after you ran an ad on Facebook, the um, people who received the ad purchased more of the consumer products that, that you purchased. So in my view, the first true closed link uh, marketing system, the first time we had true accountability at the level of transaction. Um, and um, data logics was of great interest to a lot of companies. Um, it was eventually won sort of in, in, at auction by, by Oracle. And Oracle didn't figure that, that large in our space. So this is a major move by Oracle, along with a couple of other acquisitions they've made into, into the personal data ecosystem. Data logics was, was in the crosshairs of the uh, Federal Trade Commission in that work that I talked about where they were bringing people in, you know, data logics had to come in a couple of times, uh, and yet it passed scrutiny and was acquired with no perceptible um, damage to, to their value. Um, Telstra, the Australian telecommunications company, buys ULA. That's interesting because telecommunications do, didn't figure very large in our, in our study because when we talked to telecommunications companies, they denied that they had any interest in selling the data that, that they possess. <laughs> and if someone says they, they don't They've sell... They've been around the block on this one. <laughs> Is that right? Well, telecommunications, yeah, in general, right? They're, I mean, they're, very, they're very skeptical of, of any form of regulation, so I'm sure they would deny it. But you, do you think they're not telling the truth? From a Canadian, well, I don't know about a U.S. perspective, but from a Canadian perspective, for sure they're involved in data. 
So do you think that their chief financial officer knows that in that top line revenue is a big chunk of revenue that comes from selling data? Because that's our test. Are you hiding you know, money that you made from selling data? Mm. One of the things they'll say is, oh, we use it ourselves. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we obviously monitor our own uh, direct marketing efficiency. Well, that's fine. Uh, at least it, 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 it's not fine. Um, but it, it, it means that it's excluded from our number. Yeah. But it's when Do you they, think they really are just using it themselves, though? Well, uh, you know, that's, if, if you could find a way to help them to, to sell it without appearing to sell it, that would be a great entrepreneurial opportunity because mm -hmm. they know fabulously important things about individuals. Yeah, it's that yeah. kind of thing. Um, now, this Tesco buying Sociomantic is interesting because Sociomantic is part of Dunhumby, which is part of the uh, loyalty program management industry. And so what's happened is Tesco is now running, you know, it, it, it owns Dunhumby. It's now doing its own um, internal. So something that was marketplace has now come internal. And then more fascinating is this week, there's a lot, and probably for the last month, there's been a lot of speculation that WPP is going to buy Dunhumby. I've heard uh, from people like Netflix that they don't sell our data. Do, do you have any evidence to, uh, um, I'm, I'm passionate about Netflix, and so I'm just curious, <laughs> I'm going to destroy my life of them by telling me that they do sell our data. Well, let's say they do. <laughs> what, would, what, what would you then feel? Would you change the movies you watch? No, but, um, but you know, I would just have a little bit less respect for the company, which I feel almost does you know, no evil, like, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, because it's, uh, no, 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 it doesn't do adverts. Yeah. And so, uh, and they did claim that they don't actually sell the data about what you watch and about how you watch. So I just wanted to, yeah, if, if it was. So if they came to you and said, look, you, you've got two choices, because we're broke. Either we can advertise inside the movies or we can continue doing what we've been doing, which you haven't even noticed. Which would you say they should do? Oh, I'd carry on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah okay. <laughs> right. So, I mean, that literally is the trade-off in many cases. If advertising is the solution to respecting privacy, yeah. or no, actually, it's not that, it's not that simple, no, but, but we can advertise or we can, or we can sell your data. Yeah. Uh, and we can do both, but advertising is intrusive <laughs> and selling data is innocuous. So I don't know. Um, so uh, uh, just a couple of thoughts about Canada, because I'm, I, I'm very intrigued and, and I think it's a great research topic in the Canadian approach to this sector. So these are a few companies that I think in every case are in the personal data ecosystem. Um, and yeah, right. Yeah, Mobify is a, is a mobile news spin-off. I think that's, that's correct. Um, and they're not in our study, obviously. So I haven't got, uh, you know, we haven't done due, due diligence on these companies. Um, but... Um, but the, the, the researchable question in my mind is the extent to which these are publicly funded versus, uh, versus venture capital funded. And I don't know if anyone's looking at that question, but the, st the startling natural experiment that occurs across the Canadian-United States border is the, is the very large role of um, state and local funding in getting people you know, off and running. Um, so, and, and the, the pros and the cons of that approach. So on the one hand, it's exhilarating for a young entrepreneur to be able to seek uh, funding uh, on extremely attractive terms as opposed to the American practice of selling your soul to, a, to, a, to an angel investor. On the other hand, right now, Radiant 6, which you know, must have been a perfect example of public funding, uh, then got acquired by Salesforce, handsomely rewarded the public funders who then cashed in. Uh, but is now laying off people because as part of Salesforce, its, its staffing requirements aren't as great and is now being sued, I think, being sued, or at least, no, it's being, it's being thrown around as a, as a, as a political uh, hot potato uh, by the opposition pol politicians in, um, in, in, in the province. Uh, is it Nova Scotia or, or uh, I think it's Nova Scotia? Uh, because they, they, they got funding uh, on the basis of jobs that they were creating and now they're laying off the jobs less than a year later. So that's the thing that doesn't happen with VCs. They just, they just put you into Chapter 11. <laughs> it's painful, but it's over and you don't have the political ramifications. Hootsuite, um, which is a pretty substantial player in this space and would certainly figure on our list if we'd included Canada, uh, was totally VC funded, as I understand it. Somebody may disagree with me. 
So I, a play of fish is my favorite example, which we, we've followed since its inception. Um, it, it's, it's the worst dating site in the world. Um, they don't even bother to, to fit the faces onto the pages. Uh, they stretch them. If your picture's not the right shape, they just stretch them. You look like a lunatic. <laughs> uh, but, but their business model is essentially that you go there, you, it's free, you sign up, you get used to uh, being in the dating space, you get no results, so you, 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 you move to Match.com. And so they are essentially an affiliate marketer for the, 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 the dating industry. They make a lot of their money selling leads. When they started up, he, um, he has a case study at Microsoft because he used some sort of uh, database which just grows, it builds itself. So, and, yeah. uh, and his only customer was Google, Google Ads. And as you said, he advertised his competitors, Harmony, Match, and that's all he did. And so he had no VC money, and it was free to use, free to advertise, free to watch, and, and it just grew, it, it you know, was one of the biggest websites in yeah. Canada. Isn't and, that beautiful? And, uh, and all he did was provide channels to his competitors. It's like you make a really good, so a really bad soda and you sell <laughs> leads to Coca-Cola. <laughs> Rescue this person from this appalling service, which I'm... <laughs> one of the data points we had a few years ago was 10 million in revenue for one employee. Yes, right. And uh, the latest investigation, 66 employees. I thought when we went looking that he'd have disappeared. But in fact, he's flourishing. So. You know, crazy things. That's what I love about Canada. You do things we would <laughs> Sanity would not have dictated. That was a smart thing to do. Anyway, um, how am I doing? So I'm, I'm more or less finished. I, I have some examples, but, um, but they're more sort of related to what I would teach. Yeah. How does, in terms of mapping the ecosystem, yeah. since there's so much change, uh, how often does it need to be updated? What can a mapping it do in terms of knowledge of it? Yeah, um, th that's really troubling me in the last three months because I'm, I'm now pretty actively building the course. I would imagine the course would, would start with a picture like that. We then look at, for example, salesforce.com and its acquisitions and we'd ask ourselves, what's, this, what's the game behind these acquisitions? And the skeleton model falls apart at that point because now you're saying, uh, you know, I think the skull should get so big that the skull envelops the whole body. And then we don't need bones for the arms and legs, but we just roll around. I don't know what the, you know, I don't know what the right metaphor is to account for the industry that I see emerging since the time of the study. Uh, but I think that can be a worthy project to, to investigate. And it could be that from an entrepreneurship point of view, you still have to think of yourself as providing strategy services or consumer-facing services, or um, I mean, just to, to show you, you know, you're probably familiar with with uh, programmatic ad buying. So I go on the web, I visit uh, um, uh, New York Times. New York Times has a little ad server on the side and the question is which of these ads should they serve to me? And the answer lies in a bunch of candidates who want to be the, the, uh, the ad, who go to an ad exchange, which looks at a supply side platform, which is like a, an information center that uses this thing called a data management platform, which collects information from the bidders, from the seller, uh, to decide who should win the auction. And uh, based on the knowledge then of who, I, who this you know, red blob, blob with white eyes really is, one of these players will win the auction and that ad will be served by the New York Times. And all of this happens in, in, in about approximately a quarter of a second so that the page that is assembled uh, appears to be a single page, but in fact comes from two very different sources. Um, all of the components of that structure started as entrepreneurs. So Blue Kai was, was sitting in here um, the the demand-side platforms are sitting in here, and slowly and inexorably, these individual entrepreneurial endeavors have been soaked into the work of Google and Facebook and, uh, ya and Yahoo and, a and AOL and so on. When you read the, the story of Google and its success, I assume that Google did almost all of this at one point. You know, like it was more integrated. But what you're saying is that yeah. the, success of, the success of Google was also dependent on lots of other startups who actually provided these sort of services in the background. So I assume that Google did most of this itself. That's the way I, I would imagine the story should be told. Yes, that Google starts as a search algorithm, trying to provide it as a third party source to publishers, eventually realizes that the publishers aren't that good, discovers paid search through borrowing the example from, from Yahoo, 
then slowly begins to realize the need for this, uh, this exquisite uh, high speed, you know, spider catching flies as they hit the web kind of an infrastructure. And, and, and that's more or less how it's gone. So yeah, so from an entrepreneurial point of view, you still need the, uh, the, the, the articulated structure of the industry, but you anticipate that that structure will, will integrate over time. Um, this is Facebook using, using data logics to work out whether ads work in supermarkets. Um, an interesting question to me is why Walmart doesn't have a loyalty program. And if you use a service called Ghostery, which I'm sure some of you do on your browser, you will see that when you go to Walmart's website, all these people are watching you. <laughs> Ghostery tells you all these people are interested that you've, you've dropped in. And so uh, that allows for a structure like this to take place in which many of the benefits of a loyalty program are provided without the need for the loyalty program. I, I, I don't completely understand it uh, because it seems like there are holes in that data set. But, but, uh, and then just to the, the post office versus Google, um, it's not speed. It's not that the post office takes three days and Google takes a fraction of a second because people are spending uh, two to three dollars per contact with the post office and fractions of a penny with Google. So that means that at the margin, the two are performing equally well. The ROI is, is, is both. So it's not about speed, it's about the ability to detect response. And I'm contending that the post office is selling inputs, Google is selling results. And so if I could run the post office, I would, I would want to have you auction uh, you know, when you, when you wanted to send out mail, you would have uh, the opportunity to auction for that household. And um, you would set price not per, per input, but per output. To do that, you've got to measure whether someone's opened the letter. So there's a major invasion of privacy, but you can see the, uh, the enormous economic implications of so doing. So if I could say, I will pay you only when someone opens the envelope, then uh, many of the benefits that Google have, have, has generated would apply to the post office, which based on the $2 versus fractions of a penny principle must be a much, much better marketing medium. I mean, what you get from opening an, an envelope, reading a catalog, absorbing the stuff that's, that's now in your house is vastly greater than the benefit that the, the same firm would get from, from being clicked on, on the column next to, next to a search result. Um, so I said this was about privacy. Um, I think I've set up what, what my prejudice is, but just a couple of factual observations. The, the contrast between Europe and America is, is very, I think, very important. The USA doesn't have a, a, a universal principle. The EU exactly does. It issued a, a directive uh, that declares a fundamental human right to privacy. The USA has sector uh, privacy restrictions, so there's there's HIPAA in healthcare, there's financial services, there's may not advertise to children. And these things allow, for example, my son is involved in, in, in um, the, a, a product that sells to children. He has de defined his target market as children over 13 because the law told him that he, he would be in real trouble if he tried to market to children under 13. So his economic decision is constrained probably in a counterproductive way uh, by privacy regulation, but nevertheless is very different to what would operate here, where he simply couldn't be in business at all. Um, and then, so, so that I think is a, is a, is a sort of a studyable issue. Uh, are we better off to have a, uh, you know, the, the EU data protection supervisor says we share the same basic idea of privacy, but there's a huge deficit on the US side. I think, on the contrary, personally, I think on the contrary, there's a a huge opportunity on the US side, which is why Google and Facebook developed in the US and, and, and not in Germany or the UK. Um, so without a blanket right to privacy, US technology designers have to live within a space between free but intrusive and paid for but private. They have to, fight, they have to navigate that space where in a more universal regime, there would be no possibility of, um, of, of negotiation. Uh, so I think this is my last slide. Um, I think we, we have a long way to go with respect to privacy and legislation. I think it's important to consider the impacts on entrepreneurship, the impacts on the economy, the impacts on the use of this new fuel for industrial development uh, without 
a fairly liberal privacy regime, um, a lot of the value of personal data will not be achieved. Um, nevertheless, there will be regulation. And I think that regulation will find it's much easier to stop people trafficking in data than it is to stop them owning data. So internalization of data effects sort of flows directly from that. If I can stop you, you know, uh, selling marijuana, uh, that's one easy thing to do, but I can't really stop you smoking it uh, as long as you do it in the privacy of your home. I think the same applies to data. Um, and as a result, it's more likely that large firms will acquire startups and therefore internalize those data flows than that startups like Google will grow to become large like Google. So I think the days of, you know, Google's pretty well ensuring, okay, we got in to the market. Now let's make damn sure nobody else gets into the market. Um, so last comment, innovation lies in the hands of those with the best data, the best analytics, and the imagination. Uh, and um, the freer the environment within which those, uh, those forces can operate, uh, the better for, for entrepreneurship and for the economy. So I think I've managed to avoid having to deal with any questions, so thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Do you have a few minutes if there are any final questions? Yeah. Is the uh, different privacy legal framework in Europe versus the U.S. result in some activities being legal in the U.S. and illegal in Europe and vice versa? Most definitely. Most definitely, and, and that presents enormous problems for people operating in both economies. And um, there's a lot of lobbying by American firms of the EU, to, uh, because the EU is contemplating a new privacy regime, and likely, I think, I don't know, uh, more onerous. Uh, so for example, the, the right to be forgotten is, is a colossal burden on Google. Um, and Google's doing its best to show how inconvenient it is by obliging everybody who wants their past forgotten in America, in, in Europe, but making it freely available in America. So all you need is a VPN to find out what's really going on. Uh, so in a, in a world where data wants to flow uh, you know, freely, these, these barriers are presenting enormous problems. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. Yes. Yes. What are your thoughts on the role of cities in all of this? I know, for instance, Vancouver um, has talked about releasing a, a lot more data available. Um, it would help social science research. It would help them in terms of. Um, so a lot of cities have seen that if they release data, entrepreneurial young coders will use that data in interesting ways to help them optimize how the city could be run. So do you see that? Um, I don't know. Just in, in what you're seeing, are you seeing? sort of interesting data sources come up as well that we wouldn't think of. For yeah. instance, I wasn't aware that they, I don't know that they do it in Canada, but I wasn't aware in the US that they sell your driver's license data. Oh, it's, yeah, yeah, that's a big, that's a very important data source. So <laughs> do, you know, do they sell tax data or um, um, property tax data, or those kinds of things um, as well? Yeah, so, so, so income tax data is the subject of a specific law, so that's part of the patchwork. Um, I, I like your question a lot. I, I think the more decentralized the uh, area of jurisdiction is, the more you can have natural experiments, and the more uh, a city that, uh, that has high privacy has to explain to its citizens why it has low economic productivity, assuming that's the outcome, which I predict it is. So right now, um, to, in, the, in the spirit of your example, um, uh, Uber has cut a deal with the city of Boston to make Uber data available to the city for traffic planning purposes. Simultaneously, the city of, practically simultaneously, the city of Boston has agreed to write rules uh, and regulations governing the licensing of Uber drivers. Simultaneous with that, taxi drivers have sued the city of Boston for devaluing the value of their medallions. So all of that's happening as a nice local experiment. If that were happening at the federal level, I guess it would just get kicked under the carpet. But now we'll see how that unfolds. Uber's going to watch what happens there and take it to, you know, to other cities. Uh, it's a great experiment. Yeah. Uh, of course, the value of Uber's data on traffic movement is much, much less than the value of the combined uh, taxi driver industry. And so there's an example of centralization uh, proving to be quite valuable. Um, and and I, I just wish the taxi industry would, would see that. And, and you know, instead of 
responding with litigation, respond with entrepreneurship. Someone can roll that up. I mean, if, here, in, here in Vancouver, you've got entrepreneurs generally, this is the mobile news story, right? A company that tracks bus movements and feeds that into a central system rather than having the bus company do it and be dead right but three months wrong. <laughs> So, yeah, that's, yeah. I, I read about a, a case, I'm not sure whether this is actually something you would have encountered, uh, a company called Bridge, active in Boston, that mm. is using personally identifiable data from a smartphone to uh, build out its own fleet of buses and takes on the public transportation system. And so they have now buses going through neighborhoods because they know where people are at any given point and where they travel and how long they oh. stay there. Mm -hmm. The question mm -hmm. was, what are you doing with that data once you have it? Is it really only for internal commercial purposes, or is it part of your value proposition for another customer? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, to, to Ian's point and to the point you've just raised, that's the, the, the problem, is that we can see economic value from the, the obvious uses of data, but we are not that clear about, about the secondary uses of that data. Yeah, so it's quite possible to be, to be frightened of this new environment, but, uh, um, but I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> you know I, I, as far as I'm concerned, personally, is you let it run, and then you step in and, and, and squeeze out the excesses. Because you don't, you, you, you don't know what you're giving up until you've let it run for a while. Okay, um, great. Well, thanks very much. <laughs>